Rock on, rock on. Oh, that's something, eh? Came from Madison, Wisconsin to Calgary, Alberta in two days. And no hassle with the customs clearance as well. They take care of all of that. In fact, you know what? There's a lot of uh, auto parts places would get a lot more by business, especially the guys that are reproducing parts for 49 Chevs or whatever. Um, but they just send it and it gets to the border and it gets messed up in these customs guys, right? And then some guy in a minivan shows up, you know, two weeks later, and you gotta pay him a hundred and some bucks on your Visa card <laughs> because uh, of some kind of fees or whatever. Well, the truth is there's no fees on these, on, on auto parts that come across the border from the US into Canada. And so normally what I do is ship to one of those shipping places, actually in Sweetgrass, Montana. And so they'll just collect your stuff, costs what, four bucks a package or whatever, and, uh, and they keep it and then you drive down and you pick it up. So if you're picking up a couple thousand dollars worth of stuff, it's worth it. You bring it across the border, you pay the GST, unless the border guy's really happy that day, you don't even have to pay the GST. He says, have a nice day. I'm like, thank you, sir. <laughs> but no, no, if you get it stuck in all these scams that are like, you know, customs agents. Oh man, I tell you what. They, got, they just do whatever they want. They got like 20 different fees they charge you or something. <laughs> if for nothing, because it's free, right? Anyway. God bless Rock Auto. So today's drive shaft day for Cherry Red. <laughs> getting, the, getting the hidden parts done first. And um, so because I have to lengthen the drive shaft, I had to buy another one and then use a piece of the old one. <laughs> if I was gonna shorten it, um, I could have just used the old one, except that once I did take it off, the, um, the joints and stuff were rotten and uh, it needs to be renewed anyway. My wife wanted to know what this big box was. I told her it was her Christmas present. She was quite happy with that. Then I got her an iPad <laughs> and she's never looked back. All right. This is one of those uh, unboxing videos <laughs> where you buy something and unbox it. So everybody who didn't buy Something can watch you unbox it. Ah, it's well packed anyway. And I just bought the cheapest one they had on the Rock Auto website because, you know, it's probably made by somebody else anyway. Right? Like, how do you know? And a lot of times, you spend more thinking you're going to get more? Yeah, maybe not. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But uh, the thing is, this is going to look really close to the old one anyway. Of course, this is one of those things they tell you to never try at home. But the truth is, whatever we lack in tools, we can make up for it with a good idea. <laughs> and we may not have a good idea right now, but by tomorrow morning, whatever puzzles us will be answered with a good idea. Let's talk about a little bit of drive shaft theory and start with the engine, okay? So let's say you've got a V8 engine in uh, the front of your car and a rear wheel drive, and the engine slopes to the back, right? It slopes down towards the back. The tail shaft is lower. And the carburetor plane, right, or the manifold top plane is what you usually level to, right, going front to back. And I was taught that the reason that the engine slopes to the back is to help the cooling because the back cylinders get hotter and there's be more oil back there. I kind of think that's crazy. <laughs> it sounds like a good theory. I think it has more to do with making it fit, right? Because if it slopes back, then it's easier to get that drive shaft down or that tail, tail shaft out of your transmission down into where, um, you know, you got more clearance under the floor. When you look at the, the angle of the output shaft on the transmission, okay, and it's sloping down a little bit, right? And there's your tail, tail piece there. And so basically you've got an angle there that is a factor of X, let's say. 
And then when you mount the rear end, the differential, at the back of the car, you want to have the pinion shaft, the angle of that pinion shaft, is going to be the same angle, X here, as this angle, so that they're running um, parallel, not, not in alignment, but they'll both be at the same angle, okay? So your, your pinion shaft, that's why the pinion shaft should point up a little bit, okay? If they're the same angle, then you don't need any constant velocity universal joint. Now I've got a 52 Willys Jeep that um, has a diesel, turbocharged diesel engine in it and a five-speed transmission and of course there's no room for a drive shaft. <laughs> the output shaft of the transmission nearly touches the rear end. So we lengthened the body 20 centimeters and uh, just to get enough room in there and then put a CV joint uh, on the drive shaft so that the differential can actually point up the pinion shaft going into the differential can point up towards the transmission because you know it's a four by four right and so you can do that and then you don't have to have those two angles the same but on a normal car your average hot rod those two angles would be the same okay so let's put a um, a yoke on here for the drive shaft coming out of there and then you got your shaft that angle needs to be the same the second thing is these yokes need to be the same on your on your drive shaft. Okay, so um, the shaft if this if this this one here is laying down, then this one here is laying down as well. And the reason is because universal joints, by nature, as they turn, they actually speed up and slow down, speed up and slow down as it goes through each phase of the the bearing, you know, shifting one way or the other. And so what happens if you make them the same? then the speed up and slowing down will cancel itself out by the time it gets to the rear end, right? So what's happening in this bearing will cancel itself out by this bearing doing the same thing. Now on a, on a typical drive shaft like that, they're actually very easy to shorten. I think of all the drive shafts I've built, except for the one that we're working on with, with this Cadillac, they've been shortened rather than lengthened. And I think probably what you can do is you could find a longer drive shaft, right? And shorten it, a, a used one, rather than trying to f lengthen one. Lengthen it would be very difficult. So all you do is you, you grind out a, a small line right around the well, where the weld would be on the, on the yoke at one end, and till it releases from the shaft. And what you'll find is that there is a little, you know, shoulder on the inside that's gone into the shaft, and that's what's kind of holding it well it is holding it in perfect axis alignment so then you just simply cut the weld cut the shaft to the length that you need slip that shoulder back into the shaft and then use your best eyeballing to line it up and then tack it um, you know on two sides four sides and keep lining up until you got it tacked in, in a straight as position as possible and weld it up and uh, like I say I've done dozens of these and I've never had a problem I don't think I've ever even had a u-joint go um, because of out of alignment, no vibration, no shat shattering, nothing like that. So this is a pretty simple process and it doesn't matter how many times they tell you it can't be done or that you shouldn't do it. And I've been doing it for years. I would suppose, you know, that if you're building a thousand horsepower race car, or drag strip car or whatever, I would get, well, you, you can get a special shaft made for it, right? <laughs> but for run of the mill stuff, you know, for a few hundred horsepower, this is never going to give you a problem. The easiest way to sort this out, to get the exact length that we need, is to crawl under here and measure it. <laughs> Forget the arithmetic. Well, let's go up here. Get where we can see the best. 65. On the underside of the car, from flange to flange is 65 and a quarter inches. That's the actual measurement. Then you've got this spline here that can go in and out, well, two inches really. So if we totally compress it, this drive shaft ends up being 63 and a quarter long. If we totally extend it, it ends up being 65 and a quarter long. So halfway between would be 64 and a quarter, which would make the drive shaft an inch short. Now, the other thing we have to figure is this is the front half 
and this is the back half. Well, they're not half because this steady bearing is closer to the front. And the car was lengthened back here in this section, not this section. So I need to keep this the same as the stock measurement, which is 27 and a half um, right there. So that kind of tells me where this steady bearing needs to be, or the steady bearing yeah, and the um, slip joint needs to be. So that's 27 and a half from the flange to the middle of those bearing bolts. And that actually puts the drive shaft at 64 and a quarter, which makes it exactly an inch short. That's what it's supposed to be. So we'll cut an inch, or cut this, and add an inch to this section. Found these little critters. I don't know, they're just spaces for something in my bolt drawer. And um, sanded them down on the drill press. Because these are new pilot bearings on the ends of these drive shafts. I don't want to muck them up. So we'll lubricate these up. Well, first we'll weld the stand on here so that I can actually spin this drive shaft. I mean, not spin it, but turn it, you know? <laughs> and then we'll be able to get a dial gauge on it and make sure that we have got it straight. Okay, so the first thing, clamp this steady bearing to the bench. There's a little tab underneath there. And so this is just holding down on it, and then on this side, the C-clamp's holding down on the tab. And then built these two little pivots here, little axles, for it to run on. And this one here, it's important that I left it out an inch, so that's barely stuck in here. Because what happens is when we cut this thing here, and we can move it an inch out, it's got to be able to slide on there an inch and that'll keep it in alignment. And then the same thing at the other end, built another one here, lubricated it, stuck it in there so it doesn't wreck the seal and the bearing. So then measuring, and, and basically, you know, like anything, you just measure as many ways as you can from as many angles as you can, trying to get a straight through line with no, no, uh, no angle on that U-joint. Um, because I want to be able to turn this, and that's the idea. I won't be able to spin it, you know, like uh, high speed, like 3,500 RPM, I think is what they test them at. But I can spin it, turn it, and measure any out of round with a dial gauge. So that's the goal with that. And then, so basically my trusty laser level, I love this thing, because um, it, and I, I leveled it up, uh, I think it's level, is it level? Just about, there we go. So, with that light on, I use this little V-shaped thing here, and the level, and so if I get a point on here, at which this is straight on the pipe, okay, level on the top bubble, and it's right on that little node there, then I go over to this one, do the same thing, level it up and make sure that it's right on that little node, the same. Okay, and then down at this end, this is going to be the, the important one. And I've jimmied it until I uh, wiggled it around until I got it exactly on that little node as well. So, all that does is give me a straight line through the universal joint so that when I spin it, turn it, there's not going to be any wobble here. That's, that's, all I, that's all I wanted to get out of that. No wobble there. So before we cut this, we want to check this for out around. We'll set the dial gauge here on like zero. Something like that. Probably five thousandths out of round. I mean, that could be the paint or anything, right? So that's, that's running pretty true. Well, I think we better call it a day because I don't want to shortchange you on the details. And if you are actually working on shortening or lengthening a drive shaft, you know, you're saving thousands of dollars by doing it this way. And you're going to discover some things that I haven't discovered yet. And maybe next time you can make the video and help the next guys <laughs> do an even better job. But you know, 
the process of getting the job done. It's steps, and all the steps aren't easy and they're not all fun. Sometimes you got to take a bit of a break, got other things to do this morning, had to shovel snow, four inches of snow all over the driveway and the sidewalks. And yet, every time I get a chance, I get down here in the shop and get working on something else. Because stuff in this 06 Cadillac CTS into a 49 Chev fleet line, there's a lot of messy work. <laughs> there's a lot of on your back sparks coming down. I've been throwing socks away every couple of days because they're full of holes. You should get me some boots. One day, when we drive this Chevy Fleet Line slash Cadillac out those doors, I sure hope the drive shaft doesn't wobble.